And we're back for another exciting episode of Wood by Wright uh, live Q and A. Uh, so that'd be interesting. So <laughs> um, if you don't uh, know what I do, I try to do this about once a month, where I'll answer your questions, um, go live, and you can submit any question you want. Uh, if you are watching this and it is not live, um, I'll try and leave a link to all of the questions that were asked in the discussion down below. Uh, that way you can look at the questions that were asked and skip straight to that timestamp. Timestamp stamp might be off by a minute or two. Um, I try and keep them fairly close, but uh, all of the questions should be listed down below. Um, so yeah, let's get into this. If any of you in the uh, live group have a uh, question, go ahead and post it there. Uh, and if you can put question at the beginning or something like that, just so that it makes it separate from all the chat, makes it a little easier to find an answer. Uh, so far, uh, of uh, Brad from Blicked Woodworks. I, I think that's right. Blicked Woodworks. Blacked, blacked, bleaked. Great guy. <laughs> uh, Shogun Jimmy, good to have you here. The Duck, Mr. Ducksworth himself. Uh, it looks like we're actually having a decent group today. So if you have any questions, go ahead and leave them down below. Oh, thanks, Brian. Uh, Barry, sorry, the words are a little small. Barry Irwin, thank you. <laughs> so um, I thought I would bring you guys up to date on a project that I'm working on. Uh, it kind of started with uh, um, getting into high glues or getting into them more. I've, I've been using uh, liquid high glue, like the tight bond stuff and uh, old brown high glue, uh, which is uh, um, a high glue you have to warm up, but it, it's still liquid. So it's, it's a little easier to use. Um, but I've been then getting into mixing my own high glue from pellets and chips um, and possibly uh, I'm going to be working on a little bit later making my own high glue from rawhide or uh, um, leather scraps I have. And so I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with this uh, project, but that really started me wondering what are the strength differences between all the high glues and is it really worth mixing up my own or is the tight bond stuff just as good and i have no idea i've never i've never tested it and compared it and i thought well this might make a good video so i posted that out to the group of testing these glues and then i had someone else say well why don't you test it against regular uh, pva glues and then construction adhesive and epoxy and ca and now i have a list of i think 25 different glues that i'm intending to test and I'm getting into this in as, as scientific a method as I possibly can. And I'm right now, uh, I'm, uh, I have a, a system set up for around 300 tests to be done. And it's, it's kind of taking over my brain right now, but uh, I'm really looking forward to this. So that is a video that should be coming out in a month or so. Uh, I'll have a lot of building to be done on. Uh, if that's something that interests you, I'll be putting a lot of information on my second channel, Wood by Right 2. Uh, and I'll be putting up a lot of the ideas and asking for suggestions from the group. So if you'd like to help out with that and uh, um, give some ideas and suggestions, um, hop on over to Wood by Right 2 and take a look at those videos. Uh, so let's uh, dive into some questions. Uh, Barry Irwin asks, um, sharpening scrapers uh, like the Stanley number 80. Uh, I actually have a video on um, sharpening scrapers, um, the, the, the Stanley number 80, 80 scraper. Um, the, the difference with it is it has a, a 45 degree bevel on it. Uh, that bevel makes turning a burr really easy. Um, so you, 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 you sharpen it just like you'd sharpen any scraper out there, except for you just do it on the one side with the, the angle on the bevel. And uh, that makes it really easy. The, the downside to it is you can't then flip the card over and use the other side like you can with a, with a Stanley, with a, a standard scraper. Um, but having the bevel on there makes it easy to turn so you can pull it out and, and put it back in. Um, being that it's in a frame like the Stanley number 80. And if you don't know what it is, it's a cabinet scraper. So it's a, a two handles with a scraper blade in between. And uh, it, because it's in that frame, you you have to put it in there and, and take it out if you want to sharpen it. And you'd have to put it in, flip it over to anyway. So it's really not worth the time of sharpening both when you can just make it easier to put the 45 degree bevel on there. That being said, a lot of people still use it with a flat edge and not having the 45 degree bevel so they can have a bevel on both sides. So I guess it's a personal, personal preference. Um, but to get more into that, I'd say go take a look at the video. I talk about it in a, a good amount of detail. Um, I'll have to see if I find the link. But if you uh, if you um, Google, uh, if you search on YouTube for Wood by Wright uh, 
Stanley number 80, it'll come up. I have two or three videos on it. So let's see. Um, Bleak Woodworks. Uh, question, do you have anything planned for hitting 50,000 subs? Um, no, I don't right now. Um, <laughs> I, I thought about doing a giveaway, but I just have um, so many other things going on right now that it is not, um, I, I'm not going to be able to make it happen. But yeah, I should be hitting that in a week or so, something like that. Not growing very fast right now, but uh, it'll be coming up. Um. How's the training going for your runs? This is from The Duck. Uh, have you been sticking with it? Yeah. Um, I'm Tomorrow I'm going to be doing an 18-mile run. Day after that I'm going to be doing a 16-mile run. So I'm starting to do some of the back-to-backs. I've got another six weeks until the race. Uh, for those of you who know, I'm going to be doing a 50-mile race on April 7th um, in, in uh, um, central Illinois. So that will be a, a good time. I've been planning on doing that one for a while. Um, yeah, so I ultra run. That's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so stubborn. <laughs> I do things the hardest way possible, uh, you know, woodworking and ultra running. Um, Sean Gibson, uh, uh, how useful is a compass plane if you don't have a traverser or other chair set, if you don't have other chair seat tools? I only have planes, spoke shaves, and a draw knife. Um, I guess you're asking uh, using a compass plane instead of a traverser for doing a chair seat. Um, it would not work as well. Uh, the The problem with it is that it has um, it has a bit of sole on either side of the iron, so it doesn't want to cut down a it won't cut a ditch as easily. Um, you could do it. But it would take a lot of work and a lot of resetting and a lot of tweaking. Uh, it would not be as easy to use a compass plane instead of a traverser. You could, um, but it, yeah, it would be a pain. And a traverser is actually a, a relatively easy tool to make, um, especially if you can if you can find the iron online. Uh, it's not that difficult. Um, I'd say it's actually cheaper to buy a traverser than to buy a compass plane most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah i don't i don't think i would i think i would uh i think i would spend the time to either make one or uh, go and buy one um as opposed to using a compass plane you could use a compass plane if it's the only thing you have um it would take a lot of odd settings you'd have to take a deeper cut than you would normally want um and then you'd have to do a lot more cleanup afterwards with a card scraper but it could work uh, the duck again. Is there a difference in how you sharpen the 80 and 81? Uh, no. Um, they're basically the same thing, uh, except for one of them has a wooden sole and one of them has a steel sole. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're both two different uh, um, cabinet scrapers, is the word. And uh, they both do basically the exact same thing. Actually, I think. No, originally they had a slightly different card. Uh, but they they sharpen the same way. Uh, eight. I'm writing all these down as we go. So if I stop for a moment, I'm I'm putting the questions down so I can put them in the description. Uh, good morning. Wow, there's quite actually quite a few people on here. It's uh, turning out fairly good. Maltz from uh, uh, from Germany. Good to have you in here. Actually, I'm hoping to have a few more people from Europe as I'm doing it in the morning here. Normally, I like to do them in the afternoon. It's a little easier, but I think this works out fairly well for Europe as well. A uh, question from Ian Frosli Frostler. Hey, I slaughtered my first name. Well, I, probably, I probably slaughtered another name. Sorry. <laughs> I am the great name slaughterer. Uh, he asks, uh, I really enjoy your videos and content. Wondering how flat is flat when dimensioning stock? Uh, that depends on what you're using it for. Um, if you are joining it with another board, in other words, uh, like a um, edge joining uh, for a tabletop or something of that nature, uh, you want it really flat, or at least you want it mating to the other piece. So even if it has a bit of a wave, you want the other piece to have the opposite wave so the two of them match. Um, if you are you know, doing a tabletop and you're planing the top surface of it, if you can't see a difference, then I, it's good. If you can't feel it, it's good. <laughs> you don't need to be, you know, micrometer 
um, close across the tabletop. Um, it's wood. It will move, um, and that's that's what it does. And there will be um, micro adjustments and micro twists over the years. And if you've built it correctly and the frame is solid, it will hold it fairly close to flat. Um, if you're just doing general dimensioning, uh, I, I I only go as flat as my tools will tell me. And that being said, I try to keep my tools as minimalistic as possible. I don't use a lot of um, really high accuracy tools for um, measuring flat. If if my if my winding sticks won't tell me, and my straight edge it looks fairly good, then that's all I'm looking for. Even if I see a little bit of light underneath the straight edge, then uh, that's fine. Um, I actually use a, a wooden straight edge just for that purpose because it, uh, it it kind of deforms a little bit when it comes in contact. It has a wider surface where it touches the wood, so you don't see as much light coming through there. Um, yeah, uh, you know, if 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 you're measuring to the thousandth, then you're probably measuring too much for most joinery. Um, now that that being said, if you're a machinist and that's something that really bothers you and you want to be that accurate, then go for it. Be that accurate. Uh, but I, I don't normally go that far. Uh, oh yeah, you're using the straight edge to see light underneath. Um, yeah, you're you're gonna see some light. It's wood. Um, wood has gaps. Wood has um, uh, wood has pores. Um, especially if you're using a metal straight edge, you're gonna see light underneath there, no matter what you do. Um, you don't 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 use the light trick for it um, use a, a wooden straight edge that has like a, at least a quarter inch wide surface um, and if you see light underneath that then then you might want to um, but yeah don't 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 be you know getting down and eyeballing and making a surface perfectly flat unless the surface has to be perfectly flat um, like even my bench top uh, my bench top is out of flat by probably a 16th in some places um, so several millimeters it's uh, I, it, it, there, there's no reason for it to be any flatter. Um, it, it's just, it's not, a, it's not a necessary thing. Uh, I have not found a reason for it to be any flatter than that. Um, a question from Nicholas Rupert: How thick is your workbench top, and what kind of holdfast to use? I ask because my bench is four and three quarters of an inch thick. Um, that's actually a really good question because I ran into a problem with that on my my current bench. Uh, my top is four inches thick, and um, I love that thicker, beefier top. The problem is if you put a hold fast in there, there isn't enough space for it to wiggle um, so that it pinches in there. Um, what I ended up doing is using a, a standard reamer. Uh, so you get a, a reamer that is made for Windsor chairs, and it's a very, very shallow angle. And I use that and I go underneath the bench and I ream it out. So at the, on the bottom side of the bench, the hole is about, uh, uh, about an inch in diameter. And then it goes, it tapers up about three inches into the bench. And then the top inch is exactly three quarter inch. Um, and that allows the, the, the hold fast to wiggle a little bit and, uh, hold much, much better. Um, some people will counter bore so that uh, the hold fast is only going through two to three inches of material. And then uh, lower than that, it's like a one inch hole. That works fairly well. Um, the hold fasts I use are from Black Bear Forge. Uh, he's out in Washington or Oregon. Um, I love his work and he makes some really beautiful hold fast. Um, when you're getting hold fast, you want them to be forged, you don't want them to be cast. Um, so you, you don't want, um, like uh, Gramercy makes theirs out of a bent rod, uh, but they tend to be a little slippery. I, I'm, they, they work fairly well and a lot of people have to make modifications in order for them to stick, especially in thicker tops. Um, but the, the ones from, uh, Black Bear Forge and other forges where they actually, you know, pound on them, they add a texture into the surface that makes them grip far better. So definitely check those out. Um, Finrica Woodstuff. I'm saying that wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> Has a question. Uh, in terms of wood types, species, and their potential uses, how much effort should you put into under uh, should you put in to understand? Is there any food 
food reference material books videos websites etc um shannon rogers over at the wood um the wood the wood right school the, the hand tool school uh actually has uh, several good videos on uh, wood types uh his day job is working at a, a lumber yard and he knows his lumber inside and out um once you use a few different woods, you start to get a feel for, you know, how porous is the wood? How soft is the wood? What is its deflection rate? Um, does it have a lot of silica in the surface and, uh, and, and dull the tool quickly? And then you can look at the statistics online at like wood.com. Um, and you can, you can see, you know, this, uh, um, like for instance, a maple. Maple is extremely hard to plane. Um, but it has uh, it's it's a diffuse porous, so there's no uh, the rings don't splinter out as much like oak. And so if I go online and I look at say uh, purple heart, purple heart is harder than maple, slightly or, or is it slightly softer? It's right around what maple is. It feels very similar in the plane, um, but purple heart has a little bit more um, uh, porosity in the rings, um, so it tends to splinter a bit more. Um, and so you start to see these things that you can compare one wood to the other. Um, yeah, uh, the, the best way is just experience, um, buy scraps of wood and, and plane them and feel them and, and get to know how well do they splinter? How hard are they to plane? How sharp does the blade need to be? Um, you, you know, carving in them, how well does it hold a, uh, a, a carved edge and, uh, and playing with that. Um, I have a book that I, I have referenced a few times. It's entitled wood. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, I, I don't use that as much because Google is very functional. Um, I can type in something and get all of the uh, uh, the numbers and associations that go with that. Um, hope that answers your question, but uh, yeah. Uh, what sort of mile times do you shoot for when ultra running? <laughs> Samuel Arcade. Um, it, that is wildly, wildly different. Um, in trail running, you don't really race. There is no time that you're shooting for. Whereas in road running, you're you're very interested in your your pace. Uh, trail running is wildly different, as, uh, especially ultra running, because um, there are times in the race where I will be, um, you know, power hiking a 15 minute pace, or I will be doing, you know, a 20 minute walking pace um, because of the the terrain. Um, there are other times where I'll be, you know, bombing down a hill and I'll be shooting a six minute pace. Um, I am, it is my goal for the 50 mile to complete it in, um, just faster than a 15 minute pace total for 50 miles. Um, but, uh, that means some of the time I'm going to be doing a, a 10 minute pace. Some of it, I'm going to be doing a 20 minute pace, um, a little bit of everything. Uh, so because you, you're doing a lot more hills, there are times where there are hills that you have to be on your hands and knees going up. Um, there are times where you have to be, um, you know, wading through water. Um, sometimes you're running in hip deep snow. <laughs> it's uh, it's trail running. It's uh, there, there is no pace. <laughs> you, you go as fast as you can, but still being able to maintain the, the finish. Uh, uh, Greg Wengler, way wenger i'm sorry that should be an easy name but i probably butchered it <laughs> in your opinion uh can i get started in woodworking with a set of Bex buck brothers chisels from the box store um uh, that flatten and sharpen or should i put that money and energy into a four-piece stanley set yeah you can use them um when people start talking about the best chisel or the chisel you should buy, um, I have to roll my eyes because steel is steel. It will cut wood. Steel is harder than wood. Um, so any chisel will work. The, the big questions that then come into is the quality of steel. How long will it hold its edge? How easy is it to sharpen? And until you've been working with them for a year or two or more, you're not going to tell the difference between between a harbor of steel and a really high quality Lee Nielsen chisel. Um, and, and their, their cutting ability, that's, that's not something you're going to be able to, to, to notice in, until you've been using them for a while and knowing when dull and when not dull. Um, and that's why I tell people, you know, pick a chisel for its handle. How does it feel? How does it, does it work well for you? And uh, in time, you're going to want to buy a better chisel. You're going to be want, wanting to buy something that holds its edge a little longer. That's that's natural. 
um, but find something you you like. Uh, my actual go-to chisels, the one I'm, I'm using all the time, are uh, from Aldi, the grocery store. <laughs> they sell them about once a year, and I usually pick up a couple sets. Uh, they they don't hold their edge quite as long as these are really high-end chisels, but, well, I have to sharpen them a little bit more. That's not a problem. I have a strop on the bench, and I can keep them sharp. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of their handles, which I'm going to be in the future making a new set of handles for them. Um, but they're, they're a good chisel and I like them. Um, my second set is actually the wood handled set from Harbor Freight. Uh, the, the steel on them is a little bit cheaper. Um, but, uh, they still work fairly well. And, uh, yeah, getting a cheap set of chisels is a great way to get into it. If you don't have the money for it, get a set of chisels, learn how to use them. And then you'll start to see the things that you like. Um, it is the handle shape. Um, how are the edges on them? How are the, the sides of the chisels? Uh, what is, what are you looking for? What would you rather have in a chisel? And those are types of things you won't know until you have a chance to play with them. So yeah, get a good, get a cheap set of chisels and uh, learn. Um, don't expect them to be perfect. Expect them to be a cheap set of chisels, but they will treat you well. Um, Uh, Kevin Kava uh, S. Um, have you ever worked with a species of wood named Limba? Is it stable or not? Um, I have not. I don't know anything about the wood. Sorry. Um, is it stable? That's an interesting wood for uh, interesting thing for wood. When wood is dry. It is stable. The, the the thing that makes it unstable, the thing that makes it move, is when it absorbs more moisture. Um, so you're if you're in a, a house without air conditioning, or if you're in an environment where the moisture content in the air changes wildly, wood will move more and less. Um, and so different woods have a different absorption rate. Will they'll absorb air faster or slower? Um, and so that's that's kind of what things look like, but. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I've never used that wood before. Sorry. Um, Colin Busey, uh, <laughs> how do you handle dovetails in extremely soft wood? Um, I recently attempted dovetails in an unknown wood, but it crushed, almost crumbled as I chiseled the waist. Um, you know, a lot of people will tell you to practice your dovetails in a pine or something soft and easy. And I think that's kind of confusing. One of the easiest woods to practice in is something a little harder, like a cherry um, or a soft maple. Um, because a soft wood, like a, you know, an open, wide ringed pine, will crush very easily. And you've got to have that chisel sharp, beyond sharp. Um, uh, soft woods can be very, very difficult. You have to take your time, you have to go slower. Um, your, your chisel has to be extremely sharp uh, in order not to crush the wood. Um, so that's that's the, the big thing, you know, sharpen your chisel more. You may think it's sharp, but you can always be sharper. <laughs> um, when learning woodworking, uh, a, a good chunk of learning it is learning how sharp is actually sharp. Um, because when I was first starting out, it was like a, a six months of exploration of Every day I came down and I could sharpen the same chisel a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And every time it was like this aha moment of, oh, this is what sharp is. And the next day I'm like, oh, this is what sharp is. And every time I thought I had it sharp, but then every time I could get it a little sharper. Um, but that's that's one of the big keys with uh, with softwoods is you've got to have that chisel crazy sharp. Um as a matter of fact, I'm looking for an alter alternative for white oak. Is there any suggestions? Thank you. Um, it depends on what you're making. The only reason I use white oak is, number one, I love its diversity. I love its challenge. White oak is a very hard wood to, to work with with hand tools. Uh, it's not a good hand tool wood. Um, the other thing is I've gotten quite a few good deals on it. Uh, I've run across several ads on Craigslist where they're selling off a barn full of it for dirt cheap prices. And I, I buy large lots of it and slowly work through it. And so that's one of the reasons why I build a lot of things out of white oak. Um, do, do I suggest that people go out and practice with white oak? No, it's it's a very difficult wood to learn. It's, uh, it is not an easy hand tool wood. Um, that being said, I, you know, work with whatever you want. Um, wood is wood, and uh, any wood can be worked with hand tools. Um, oop, uh, true. Trying to paste this question over. Um, so, you know, ask yourself, 
are you are you looking for something that's easy to learn? And then that case, like a cherry or a walnut, are really easy to learn. Great woods to work with. They they cut like butter. Um, the uh, the other question is, what do you want the piece you're working on to look like? Um, that's that's the best way to choose your wood. Is what do you what look are you going for? Um, with white oak, I, I'm always looking for a wild grain, and uh, things are. Um, unusual and, and swirling and odd patterns. Uh, whereas uh, uh, with a cherry, you get a much more subdued ring pattern. Um, it's a little more calm. And so you, you kind of pick what you're looking for by how it's how you want the project to look. Uh, another question from the duck. Uh, the uh, is there anything to think about when putting different woods together in the same project? Uh, yeah, how do they look? Um, <laughs> um, it, it, uh, you know, when, when, when most people get started and they start getting into different types of wood, um, at some point everyone makes a hideous box. And it's a box that has like 17 different types of wood and they're all smashed together. Um, and it looks hideous. Um, <laughs> um, once you get over like two different types of wood, you 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 have to think to yourself, "Am I going too far in this?" Um, as to wood movement, uh, if you have a really soft wood and a really hard wood, the soft wood will generally absorb more uh, more moisture faster than the hard wood. Um, and that will allow the softwood to expand faster than the hardwood. And so you might get some bending there. Um, but usually that's only if it's like over the length of a tabletop. Uh, you have to have a, a pretty large pieces connected to run into a problem with that. Uh, only other problems are if they're really oily woods. Uh, that's when you use epoxy. And then you don't have a problem with it. Uh, so yeah, unless you're, unless you're connecting two very large pieces of wood... There really isn't that much of an issue between uh, expansion and contraction of different types of woods. Another chair question from uh, Sean Gibson. Can I learn how to make a Windsor and other chairs using only pine? Right now I have a lot of it. Uh, yes, uh, the traditional wood for a Windsor chair is pine. Um, yeah, that's that's a great wood. <laughs> hey, actually, that is uh, that is the... the um, traditional wood for a lot of Windsor chairs, uh, especially like the, the Southern tradition with the, the, the yellow pine down there. Um, that is a, uh, yeah, pine is a great wood. Uh, you know, a lot of people poo poo pine. Uh, it's, it is a far better wood than, than people expect. It's easy to work with as long as your tools are sharp and it is very durable in compression. Um, it's not that poor of a wood. It's actually a really nice, nice wood to work with so no problem with pine pine's a good wood um himanso narsh nasa sorry man i'm just gonna stop right there i'm gonna butcher your name if i go any further if i haven't already i have some reasonably dimensioned lumber which was outdoors for a while it's been drying in my garage for a month can i use it to make rough sawn bench as I have no sawing surface. Sure. Yeah. Um, if it's not completely dry, then you may end up running into a problem of it moving a little bit more in the future, but that's not a huge issue. If it's been sitting in your month for a while, if it's been, if it was dry before, uh, and then you brought it into your, your shop and it's been sitting there for about a month, uh, you should be perfectly fine. Um, definitely, that would be a good thing, especially for something like a saw bench. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, pristine and perfect. You're going to be, you know, cutting into it and making dings and scratches and uh, go for it. That sounds like a great wood for it. Uh, the Woodfellas asks, uh, how is bespoke wood made items market there? Uh, can a woodworker make a decent living out of it or it would be quite hard? I guess Etsy and various online markets would help a lot. Uh, from Italy. I don't know what you mean by bespoke wood. Um, if you're talking about, you know, how is the market for making things? So that depends on the market you make. Um, for making wood and s making wood products and selling them, uh, most anywhere, but particularly in you know developed countries, um, 
in the United States particularly, it's the market is what you make it. Um, people don't go out looking for, you know, a high quality maker all the time. They'll they'll find the maker and then then have the idea of like, oh, I want that. Um, and so the, the market is what you make it and how you sell it. The word of mouth is really the best way to to sell things. Um, there, there are, with social media, there are a lot of ways to get your name out there. Um, so I hope that answers your question, but I probably messed it up. Sorry. Uh, uh, Shogun Jimmy asks, uh, naturally dried or air dried kiln or uh, kiln, <laughs> air dried wood or kiln dried wood, which do you prefer? Uh, air dried is far superior for the hand tool person. Um, air dried just, it, it cuts easier. It's, it's a simpler wood. Um, whereas kiln dried just has a feeling of being very rough. Um, once you get into power tools, it's really hard to tell the difference uh, because you, you can't feel the wood anymore. Um, but you can definitely feel a difference between air dried and kiln dried wood. Um, so yeah, if I have my choice, I'm going air dried. Um, almost all of my wood is air dried, but that's because I buy it from a lot of local sawyers or you know a guy with a farm who's cut up lumber and it's been sitting in his yard for 15 years. Um, or Matt Cremona. <laughs> uh, so air dried is my my choice so uh this is from andrew morgan how big a hole should you use in relation to the hold fast um od to get a wobble um the hold fast should be sized for the hole it advertises so if it's a three quarter inch hold fast you drill a three quarter inch hole um the, the the hold fast is actually slightly smaller than three quarter inches uh, so you, you're not actually putting a three quarter inch peg into a three quarter inch hole. Um, so if you get a three quarter inch hold fast, you drill a three quarter inch hole. Um, and for most tops, that's exactly the, the slop you want. Uh, if you get a thicker top, like a four inch top, you're going to want to taper out the bottom or uh, do something in that to, to wiggle it, especially if it's really hard wood. Um, maple, it will slip a little bit more. Uh, but yes, the 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 number that comes with the holdfast is the size of the hole, not the diameter of the holdfast. Um, uh, from Sar S H S R H the eighth Sar eight. <laughs> I live in Northern Illinois, currently Elgin. I'm just starting out with uh, space and limited. And limitations looks like i'll be doing similar projects and carving cool yeah if you're ever in the area um i'm up in rockford so uh, love to see you um the question is besides great besides great spirit hardwoods in east dundee do you know of any source in the area um i actually um i do uh, I get to know a lot of the the local um, small time sawyers? Uh, so I'll look on Craigslist and see you know someone who has a, a pile of wood. I was actually just up in um, Argyle, Wisconsin, and I purchased uh, what I think it was about 120 board feet of white oak uh, two or three days ago. Um, he had a post on Craigslist. He has a, a pile of it up there that's been sitting in his yard for 16 years and getting rid of it. Uh, there's another sawmill I go up to in uh, uh, in uh, the Wisconsin Dells. Um, he has a great supply of stuff. Um, there are a couple other uh, local guys that occasionally will have a piece here and there. Uh, but Craigslist really is. I, I don't go to any, uh, I rarely, rarely, actually, I've never purchased lumber from a lumber mill um, other than my flooring. I, I just don't, um, they're too expensive, way too expensive for me. Uh, I'm looking for prices of like, you know, a dollar a board foot or less. If it's more than that, I don't, I don't bother with it. Um, but you have to do a lot of hunting for it. And I purchase lumber like once, two, twice, maybe three times a, a year. Um, and I'll purchase, purchase large lots, um, from Craigslist. That's usually the, the common places. I have a list, I have a search term on Craigslist for them. Uh, um, and, and now Matai, um, I saw the video you did on the jig. You're planning to test wood. 
out of curiosity, what software did you use to model it? Um, I use SketchUp. Um, I uh, I would prefer to use AutoCAD or uh, um, uh, what is that? Fusion 360. Um, but the the problem is that uh, not a lot of other people have it. So if I want to give the file to other people, SketchUp really is kind of the most universal. Um, though with making 2018 no longer a free version, um, that may be changing. But yeah, SketchUp, it's it's probably the easiest 3D software to learn and get into quickly. Um, really easy, really simple, and easy to transfer around. Uh, um, big man, a win. <laughs> uh, he asks, uh, is it possible to be a good worker with zero training and apprenticeship? Yes. I've never had apprenticeship. I, I mean, I was raised in a wood shop with my, my father. Um, was a hobby woodworker. Um, but, you know, I've never been apprenticed. Most, uh, you know, I, I never was trained in hand tools. I never picked up a, a hand tool until about three years ago. Um, I, I never played with anything like that. I, and a whole of my training mostly comes from watching YouTube and experimenting. Um, if you're willing to put in the time and experiment and willing to have problems, um, it's definitely worth it. Um, I just put out a video, <clears throat> what, last week on a talk I had in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, it's an hour long video, but I really, I spend the entire hour talking about uh, the mindset that you would need to, to get started by just being willing to make mistakes. Uh, that's part of the process and one of the best ways to learn. So yeah, dive in. There is nothing holding you back. You can become a great woodworker without any apprenticeship or, or training. Um, it's not as not as hard as it looks. It's a, it's a, it's a fairly easy um, hobby to get into. Uh Uh, the hand, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read down. If you if you put a question, if you can put like question at the beginning or something that notifies me that it's a question and not just chat. Um, I'd love to see that. Uh, uh, Dylan Woodworks, I had an interesting question this morning. Uh, just a subscriber asked me, do you have any experience carving or woodworking with tools? Wanting to know more about types of roots and their attributes experience with oh with carving roots um no i i actually have not uh done much uh carving of roots i have a piece of um osage green that i want to play with um, osage green is the root of osage orange and the root system anything below ground of osage orange is bright bright green really cool wood uh, but no i haven't had a chance to experiment with it um it's it's much like carving the rest of the wood except for there's a higher silicon value <clears throat> higher silicon count um, so your chisels dull a little bit quicker um but it it works like wood because it, it's wood <laughs> uh, uh, Andrew Morgan, uh, should I go into the trouble of buying mortising chisels or are bevel chisels just as good? Ooh, let's get into a fight. Uh, this is one of uh, Paul Seller's favorite uh, um, fighting points. Um, he actually just put out an email with it uh, yesterday, the day before. Um, you know, for what, about a year and a half, I did all of my mortising with regular bench chisels. And uh, they work great. You can do it with that. Um, but a mortising chisel is so much nicer. Um, you can leverage with it better. Uh, you can you can pound it a little deeper. Uh, I really, really like cutting mortises with a mortising chisel. Um, so that's my personal opinion. But if you like a, a bench chisel, then go for it. Um, <laughs> no, hey, hey, have some fun. Don't, uh, don't let the, uh, the... There are people out there who say, this is the right way. Uh, whenever you say this is the right way to do something, you're just proving you're an idiot. There is no right or wrong way to do anything in woodworking. As long as you're doing it safe, um, have fun. Find a new way. Play around with it. Uh, there is no right or wrong or best way. Just the way that you like to do with it. Uh, Joe's Basement Woodworking. Great channel. You got to check him out. I'm looking for some new general generals to watch so my question is who 
who is your or what is your favorite channel currently that you're enjoying and watching? Oh man, I don't have a favorite qu channel. I um, if you want, you can actually see the channels that I subscribe to as I subscribe to them. Um, so if you go to my my channel page, you can see a list of that. I think I'm up to like uh, 500 channels or something like that now. Um, that I and I, I get notifications from most of them. Um, oh, man, off the top of my head, I can't think of any one channel or another. Uh, because I've been watching so many of them. Uh, there's a new channel called Extra Credit that does a lot of history things. I like watching that. Um, yeah, definitely. Just go go take a look at the, the channel list on my on my channel, and you'll you'll see a, a whole pile there. Um, sorry, I, I I can't think of anything right now off the top of my head. Uh, Uh, trying to find questions. Um, big man, a win. Uh, what top five or ten videos of yours would you recommend or any beginner to watch and start with woodworking? Um, I have a video on the first hand tools. Uh, and I think that's, that's a, a good way to dispel a lot of myths that you need all of the tools. Um, you really don't. I started off with a set of chisels, a bench plane, and a handsaw from the big box store. And I started woodworking with those. That's all you need. You have that and a surface to work on, like a folding table. Um, you can do woodworking, even the floor. Um, I did that for a while, too. <laughs> um, uh, once you once you understand that you really don't need a lot of tools, um, you, just, you just trade a lower amount of tools for working a little bit harder. Um, you can do anything with that. Then I, I really think that the uh, the side table series that I just did recently would be a good one uh, because that uh, it goes through all of the different joinery and techniques. And I really spend a lot of time th um, talking about my thought process and that why I'm doing one step first before the other. And uh, uh, once you get your mind wrapped around the the hand tool aspect of that, it's it's a lot easier, especially if you come from a power tool background. There really is a big mindset difference between power tools and hand tools. Um, after that, um, you're going to run into questions and then Google that question um, as opposed to just watching videos. Um, I, I, I like to, whenever I run into a question, I'll go and research that question as opposed to just, uh, it's the difference between YouTube and a magazine. A magazine, you watch whatever they give you every month. Whereas on YouTube, when you have a question, you go and you search it and you find answers to that question. Um, whereas you can't do that with a magazine. So that's my, my big suggestion. Um, understand the, the basic tools you need, which really isn't that much, and then pick a project and dive into it. Um, don't worry about testing and practicing and playing with things. Just dive into a project. And I have an understanding that it won't be the best project. Uh, it will end up with some problems. Oh, well, it's your first project, and it will be far better than you expect it to be. Um, pick a project, dive into it, learn the joinery you need for it, and you'll be good to go. Um, Ken Dehas asks, uh, where I live, it's extremely dry. What do you suggest to keep vintage plain knobs, totes out from drying out? Boiled linseed oil, boiled linseed oil. Um, all of my wooden handles and things like that, once a year or so, I go through and I wipe them all down with boiled linseed oil, keep them supple, keep them feeling good. Um, yeah, if you, if they start to crack, I might soak them in the oil for a while and then let them dry out. And, uh, yeah, boiled linseed oil, it's a great, great thing for that. I'm looking for a tenon saw and can't find any used ones. Um, do you have any recommendations for saws or starter saw out there? This is from Frank Bruce. Um, back saws, <clears throat> back saws in the U S are extremely hard to find and especially antique or usable ones. And when you do find them, they're just as expensive as a new saw. Um, and that's why, uh, you know, my, <laughs> My back, most all my tools are restored antiques, except for my saws. Um, I buy the the Veritas um, saws. They have a polymer back uh, as opposed to a brass back. Um, for the money, they are uh, they're phenomenal, phenomenal saws. And so I definitely say go look at that. You know, they're they're like 50, 60 bucks for a saw. 
Um, but when you compare that to others, that is dirt cheap and you get a really good saw for it. So definitely check out the Veritas saws. Um, they're, they're worth every penny and more. Um, after that, then you might as well buy a new one from someone like uh, Bearcat. Um, his, he charges way too little for his tools. Um, uh, bad axe saws, uh, Blackburn tools. Uh, those are the ones that I usually go to. Uh, my, my, my first step though, for a new saw would be uh, Bearcat, uh, B-E-A-R-K-A-T. Uh, let's see. <coughs> I have two big three foot diagonal, three to four inch thick cookies of oak. What would you do with them? Um, I would turn them into a table. Um, this would be a you know really cool table, especially um, they, they will have a crack running down them. But if you stabilize the crack and uh, and fill it, they made of a couple. Um, they would they would turn into a really cool cookie table table. Um, wall art. Um, what can't you make with them? I mean, they, they make fantastic tabletops. So you know the kids get to count the rings. <laughs> um, yeah, a stool. Um, cut them in half and and turn it into a, a wall art. Um, the the options are endless, but I think a tabletop is like is the first list that comes to most, most people's minds. It would be a, a beautiful tabletop. Um, just getting into hand tools. What planes should a power tool woodworker purchase? Uh, for power tools, the most useful plane is a block plane. Um, just for chamfer chamfering edges, um, touching up end grain, things like that, a block plane is incredibly useful. Um, number two, I would then go and get a, a number five plane, uh, the jack plane, because it's the jack of all trades. You can flatten with it. You can joint an edge. Um, you, you can do surface planing with it. Um, some people will join, jump to a smoother, uh, but a smoother is a very, very difficult tool to master, uh, to get it right. Uh, you can do that. Uh, I would also say possibly a big joiner would be would be a, a good next step after the bench plane, uh, because with a jointer you can do a lot of things that are much easier to do with a plane than actually taking the wood over to a jointer and setting it up for that. Um, but in that case, you have to have a you have to have a bench that holds things in place. Um, so I, I would probably say number one a block plane, number two a number five. Um, jack plane and uh then go from there ask yourself what type of woodworking do you actually want to do with it do you want to smooth do you want to do jointing um but that would probably be my recommendation for the power tool user um is it recommended to use the ruler trick on a spokeshave blade um from spain this is francesco singles singles um I don't use the ruler trick for anything. Um, I, I find it to be an extra step that I don't use. So I would say no. <laughs> but other people out there would say, sure, go for it. Um, experiment. Have fun. See what you like. And you won't know what you like until you try it. Uh, uh, question from Bigfoot Makes Weapons. Can you do a video on project ideas and inspiration huh i hadn't thought about that that might make a good one i'll have to think about that you know where do i get ideas for projects um <laughs> usually my project list is far longer than i'll ever get to and uh, ideas just automatically start filling it um but that might be an interesting video i'll have to think about that one thank you uh the ofe <laughs> have you ever tried to create molding iron for a Stanley 55. Uh, I have not created one for a Stanley 55. I have created them uh, for a, uh, uh, a molding plane. Um, not that difficult to do. I, I normally anneal the, uh, the steel first so that I can tool it, and then I'll use files to shape it to what I want, and then sandpaper to refine it, um, and then re-harden the, the steel, um, and uh, then use it. <laughs> um, yeah, I've never made one for a 55, but it shouldn't be that that difficult. The only issue is that it has to be the appropriate thickness of steel, and then you have to have a notch at the top to fit into the lever. So it should be exactly the same as a uh, a molding plane. Then, 
in this list. Um, have you built your own hand planes? Yes, I have uh, a couple building videos on building hand planes. Um, I do have a series that I want to build soon on uh, making a full set of hand planes, uh, but that will be coming sometime in the future. Um, I do like using my own hand planes. Uh, what is it here? uh, no issues with my... <laughs> Richard Wright. No, no issues with my name. Yeah, yeah I, I think I got that one down. I, I, I'm not going to butcher that one. Uh, thank you, Richard Wahargret. Um, uh, have you ever tried a DuPont number no. seven rubbing compound for polishing chisels? Haven't purchased a honing compound. Um, haven't purchased a honing compound. Number seven seems to help. Curious of your thoughts. Um, no, I've never used that particular one. Um, when it comes to polishing compounds, there are a lot of people who will say one thing and then other people will say another thing. And in all honesty, um, until you have a chance to use them for a long time, all polishing compounds are the exact same thing. They polish the steel. <laughs> some will do it a little bit faster, some will do it a little bit coarser, um, but until you have the experience under your belt um, to know what the difference is and how to feel it, um, you, you won't notice a difference between polishing compounds. So dive in, grab a polishing compound and play with it. And then if you want to grab another one and experiment, um, but I've never used that particular one. Um, mine or the, the cheap ones from Harbor Freight. So whatever. Um, question. I'm trying to ask best way to bring six blocks of eighth inch to quarter inch. Um, Star Trek fan fiction. Um, six blocks of eighth inch to quarter inch. Uh, sorry, I don't know what you're saying there. If you want to make them fatter so that the eighth inch then expands to quarter inch, um, glue them together. I'm sorry, don't know. Uh, uh, is there a video book or visual identity, um, all the different hand planes? This is from Scott M. Uh, yes, actually, I have a video. Ooh, copy have a video on uh, the Stanley numbering system and particularly the first uh, first eight um, Stanley numbers and what the, the sizes and numbers mean. Um, so there's that. Um, I actually have quite a few different videos on different types of planes between bevel up, bevel down, and other things. So yeah, there's, there's a good bit on there. If you search for wood by right plane types, um, you'll come across a couple different videos on that. Uh, it looks like I'm getting close to the end of time, so I'm probably going to have to stop here soon. Um, try this again. Six blocks of end grain. Bring them all into one-eighth to act as trim on, trim on marking knife all. Oh, so you want to plane things down to one-eighth thickness. Um, yeah, um, make a mark on either side at one eighth, and then plane them down to the line. Uh, that's how I would probably do it. Uh, if you're worrying about them like bubbling up when you're pushing on them, you can actually use double sided tape and glue or tape down the the wood to the bench so that it doesn't move around on you. Uh, I, I like using double sided tape for a lot of the small pieces. Uh, that makes uh, actually working with them a lot easier than trying to clamp them in place. Uh, um, so that's, that's how I do it. Just draw a line on either side, an eighth inch, and plane it down to that. Um, you can get um, small planes that actually have a, a fence on either side that comes down, so you can you can raise the the bed of the plane up by however thick those those uh, fences are on either side. Um, but I think that's a lot more work than it's worth. You can also make a track to hold the plane so that the plane doesn't go down any farther. Uh, but that's a lot more work than it's worth in my mind. So, uh, do you ever miss your power tools? <laughs> I love the uh, the romance with mine 
the idea of going all hand tools, but I can't imagine my life without power tools. Yes, when I'm doing a lot of the, the same repetitive work over and over and over again, I, I do often say, oh, I wish I just had a table so I could run these all through and make them smaller. <laughs> um, but that's kind of rare, actually, because most of the steps I, I find that's it's easier. Uh, when I'm making a lot of rips, a table saw would be nice. Um, a thickness planer would just make things really easy for dimensioning stock. Uh, but you know, those are, those are only one step in the process. So I, I don't do it that much. Shogun Jimmy, uh, what's the next big carving project? Um, I don't know. I don't have one on the list. We'll see. <laughs> I like putting in carving where the inspiration strikes. So I don't know. Uh, in your area, can you find uh, back saws at estate sales? Um, yes, but they end up being way overpriced. Um, back saws um, have such antique value that they're almost the exact same price as buying a brand new saw. Um, I actually have have never come across a antique back saw that is less than buying a new back saw um in anywhere in any place i've never come across one so no <laughs> hope that answers your question that was from gregory hickman um but antique sales uh estate sales are one of my favorite places to go shopping um, you can often get good deals on most hand tools uh, i end up going to you know eight to ten estate sales before i find one that has a few tools um, but uh, that's that's a pretty good ratio for me uh joshua wood like the last name i was offered a set of refurbished stanley hand planes four five eight for three hundred dollars is that a good deal or should i keep looking for cheaper options myself um yeah i i think that would be a, a pretty high price um refurbished number four i would normally say 50 60 bucks refurbished number five about the same refurbished number eight 100 120 um so yeah you're you're still under 300 bucks um so i, I think that's a bit high priced uh, yeah hope that answers your question um let's see i gotta add this in here 57 uh but I, you know that that it does go back to where are you from? Some places that's a great price. Some places it's not. Um, if you're comparing it to prices on eBay, that's fairly fair. If you're comparing it to prices from like the Midwest Tool Collectors Association, that's really expensive. Um, so it really depends on what you're comparing them to. I've got a friend selling a 10-year-old Stanley 60 and a half block plane for 40 bucks. I don't own a block plane yet. Should I jump on it? Um, no, that's way overpriced. Um, for a 10 year old one that that's, um, uh, yeah, no. Anything that Stanley made in the last 70 years, I'm like, mm, no. <laughs> um, uh, Question, meme plex. Uh, will you convert a cross cut to a rip saw in your upcoming video on saws? Um, not that I know of. It's not that difficult a thing to do. You just turn the file. Um, yeah, I don't know. I might be, I will. Maybe I'll do a video on turning a cross cut into a rip saw and rip saw into a cross cut. That might make it some interesting. We'll see. Thanks for the idea. Um, could you please, please, please do a video on how to work with wood when someone doesn't have a workbench or a saw bench or even a saw horse? 
you may have tricks to use. Um, actually, if you go back and watch my first few videos, um, before I built my bench, I was working on a folding table in my shop. Um, I have quite a few friends who actually use the dining room table um, or the kitchen countertop and clamp things to the countertop. Um, any surface you can do that with. Um, the hand tool school actually has a, a series on that. Uh, but my big question is then, um, you know, I tell people a lot of times that your first project should be building a bench. Um, and even if you don't think you have space, you, you always have space for some type of a bench, even if it's like a bench on bench or, you know, a bench that you set on top of a tabletop. It doesn't have to be, you know, a massive eight foot long bench. It can be, you know, a, a one foot by two foot bench or even a beam that's, you know, four foot long by eight inches wide. That can be a great bench. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, oh, I bumped. Uh, there we go. Uh, sorry, I'm reading down trying to find questions. Uh, have you ever sharpened molding planes? Is there a special technique? I recently inherited a few of them from my dad. Um, I've been wanting to do a video on uh, showing how I sharpen molding planes. Um, I have a video showing how I sharpen uh, 45 and 55 cutters, and those are basically the exact same thing. Um, so if you want to see that, definitely go take a look at it. Um, it's slip stones and sandpaper on a dowel, and they sharpen it pretty quickly. They tend to be a little softer, especially the older uh, molding planes, so they, they work a little bit easier. Uh, where do you get proper templates for Celtic carvings? Um, I've found some using Google Images, but am I but am still looking. Um, I use Google Images to get all of my my carving patterns. Uh, this is from HT Hout Working. Um, yeah, um, I use Google Images, and I keep searching for different files until I find one I like. Um, so same thing. <laughs> uh, Uh, just found a Stanley number 55 and I'm trying to date it. Any thoughts on how to date? I've found, uh, I haven't found much online. Um, for 55s and 45s, um, if you go to hyperkitten.com, he has some information on there. Uh, but there, there isn't a whole lot of um, things on there. If you go to the, the um, Unplugged Woodworker on uh, Facebook, um, they have a, a forum on there where a lot of people are asking for it. There's several good groups on, on Facebook. Um, that I'll often go to if I'm trying to date something that I can't find information on because there's usually someone in that group who's a specific aficionado on that particular type of tool. And I'll go and ask there. Uh, seeing, sorry, reading down, seeing, I think I'm getting close to the end. And... Uh, I hit most of the questions here. You mentioned uh, back saws a lot. Um, do you pull saws at all? Um, I have a few um, Eastern style saws. Uh, I don't use them as much. They take a different body mechanic uh, than I uh, than um, Western style saws, and I, I find them to be more um, irritating to me. <laughs> um, but you know, there is no right or wrong to them. Um, I, I, there are times where a pole saw is fantastic. Um, a thin flush cut saw is a, a great use for one. Um, and a lot of times where you want to cut through a board but have nice fine joinery, um, that's, a, that's a good use for it. Uh, Tom Spillany, can't touch us number seven, eight, or once or for under 175 and up. Um, where are you looking? Um, I regularly can find them on eBay for under 80 bucks. You just need to do some restoration on them. Um, I'm usually, uh, even at like uh, Midwest tool collectors, there was an event I went to last year where a guy had like uh, a dozen of them. He was selling for 20 bucks a piece. Um, most of them needed a good bit of work, but they were all fairly well functioning. Uh, 
Uh, how old is my Stan my number four Stanley? It's plastic handles and made in England. Um, probably from the 60s, 70s. Um, if you go to hyperkitten.com, there's a lot of information there on dating your Stanley bench planes, especially the number four. Very easy to date those. Um, Hyperkitten is a great place for that. Uh, Uh, when are you coming to Asheville again? I don't know. Um, need to do a hangout with uh, Johnny sometime. That would be a good place to go. Need to, I wouldn't mind getting back out there. Cool. I think I've reached the end of the questions. So this has been a lot of fun. Um, looking forward to doing it again next month. So, uh, yeah. Um, if you do have any questions that I didn't reach, feel free to send me an email. I'd love to answer those on there. You can find my contact form on my website and email me on that site spot. Um, so that's about it. And uh, until next time, have a wonderful day.